where you are going to have campaign and people want to demonstrate to the world that one, they are in charge, two, they have what it takes uh, to stay on power and the rest of them. But for all those who are making the statement, including my president, uh, the good news is that it doesn't lie in the mouth of the president to make that statement, uh, you know, uh, to the extent that of suggesting that he has to cause something to happen before it will happen. No, we decide who should lead us at a point in time. And when I say we, the electorate, you read the constitution, it's absolutely clear that the, the so, uh, power, government, spring from the sovereign will of the people. We people decide who should be our leader at a point in time. So yes, Mr. President, uh, can be excited about his own statement. But the reality is that people will decide. If they believe that they want to continue with NPP, the people will speak in that fashion. If they decide that in enough of the NPP, uh, you know, work that they've done, they don't want to see, they won't, don't want to know, and that they should give way to another party to come in, Ghanaians will decide. So, yes, Mr. President, uh, can make a statement, but he will only excite himself. The reality will be what December 7th. The president has also had occasion to refuse a request to have the KPMG report on the SMO contract released. And the president is citing Section 51A and BI of the ITI Act. The president stated that he has the right to reject requests for information deemed crucial. And according to the presidency, the KPMG report contains sensitive information falling under these provisions. This has been a matter of high public interest. The president commissioned KPMG to investigate, based on which details were captured in this white paper on actions to be taken. What do you make of the president's decision to, re to refuse the request of the Indian Foundation for, for West Africa to have the KPMG report published? Yeah, the problem, actually, uh, I'm currently doing a work on that, on the, the RTI and some of these weakness. This is a major weakness of the law, that in one breath, the law is ready to let go some information of the public, that in other words, the public can access information. In another breath, the same hand restraining you that I will not give you information. That is the law, and that is the problem. That is a major problem associated with the law. The law, at the point in time, wants to give you what access uh, to information. At the same time, they want to restrict or take, will not want to give you uh, access to the law. So which is which? I think that we need to get back to the drawing board and then see this weakness. It's a major weakness with the law so that we can really uh, do something about that. Because if the whole issue is to give people uh, access to information in the public sphere, which is in line with the good governance agenda of what? The good, go good governance con concept touches on what? You know, uh, transparency, which is a function of what? A free, inf free information and then easy accessibility of that information. So if that is missing, then there is a big problem in there. Then it defeats the whole purpose of what having uh, that law. So I think that uh, you cannot fault the president uh, entirely based on the nature of the law. But if you also want to look at it carefully, <laughs> the president can say that this is of a grave uh, public interest. I have nothing to hide in there. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, that will should worry me. So public, have access to it, and let's have interesting conversation about that, right? So uh, it's a two-way traffic in there. One is that the law itself has created that problem. And based on that, you know, for politics, people will take advantage of the slightest weakness associated with a process or a law or a procedure. So you don't leave that gap for people to offer. But... Uh, I, as a student of democracy and good governance, my interest is that, look, uh, this is of grave public interest. Remember, all that we are doing, we are doing it in the interest of the public. So if the public uh, is interested in knowing what 
has happened. And remember, the public has the right to know. All right. Then the public, I am saying that, yes, have access to the public. And because of straw, as soon as the president leaves office, down for me, anybody can assess it. If he doesn't want anybody to assess it today, it can be assessed one another point in time. So why? Give it out and then move on. So if I were the president, uh, that would have been my position. That law is a, of great public interest. So I'm going to give it out and that's all. But the law, we must also not lose sight of the fact that there's a great weakness associated with it. And then one of it is this. Another one is the cost associated with it. People are not able to work pay for the, 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 the access and the rest of them. So, in the spirit of good governance, the president should release the report? I said, if I were him, remember, I'm not the president, but I'm saying that there are these weaknesses, but look, for the purposes of good governance, if I were the president, I would just release it. But look, have it, the public has the right to know, see what you're supposed to see and all that. But now, as it is, based on the law, you can't fold the president uh, completely because that weakness is there. And that lacuna, people will uh, take advantage of. In politics, uh, people will take advantage of that. The Domahini has been meeting the flag bearer of the MPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Now, he says, Dr. Baumia, you are respectful intelligent and more striking is the fact that your utterances are devoid of insult and are decent he thanked so this was when the vice president met uh, the Bono regional house of chiefs mm. and this is what he had to say about the MPP flag bearer um, should this be I mean can this be seen to be a subtle endorsement of him? Oh, I don't see that. I mean, you are saying that the person is decent, his language is decorous, and all that. Uh, he has not supported any policy. All right? I'm not a lawyer, but my little understanding is that uh, for the ruling of this court, you don't endorse all right, uh, 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 a political actor. You can endorse his policy and the rest of them. He's saying that, yes, um, your language is decent. This statement can be made by any human being, that your language is decent. We attack the president. We attack the vice. We attack other political actors because uh, sometimes their language is not decent. Uh, it's too harsh, intemperate, and all that. When we do that, can you say that uh, we have endorsed them or we have attacked them? <laughs> All right. We are talking about things that ought to be within the political space, right? Um, yeah, you are decent, your language is uh, okay and all that, but uh, I have not endorsed you. That would not amount to anything, anything, uh, uh, anything. Imagine the, 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 the chief said that, look, um, your language is decent, uh, your policy, this policy of yours is wrong. Would you also have a beef with him? All right. He's not endorsing anything. He's just telling you who you are. But the fact that I say your language is decent and all that, does it uh, give you any inkling as to whether I vote for you or not vote for you? Does it suggest to any person that, look, this is a person that you must vote for? I am talking something about, I'm saying something about something that is characteristic of you your language, the way you communicate, fine. Mm, but you can have the best means of communication. You can be eloquent, you can be fluent, you can uh, have superior understanding of the issues, but it does not necessarily mean that I'm going to vote for you. That if I say all these things, it means that I am with you. No, it does not in any way. I'm a non-lawyer. I'm speaking as a political scientist and a political communicator. Uh, but I don't see it. There was a part that suggested that Dr. Baumia should look wide in the choice of who he will pick as a running mate. Of course, there are some who view comments like this as meaning that almost everybody across the country would have an interest in lobbying for their 
sons, for their king's men, to be considered for the number two position of the land. Thus, the delay opened the room for as much of lobbying, and is it productive or counterproductive? Oh, the, I'm not sure the chief. I'm sure we are still talking about the chief. Yes. The, the chief's statement about that, you know, uh, look white. There are a whole lot of people, human resource. God has blessed us in this country that you can tap into. Look white and select from uh, the one you deem fit. <laughs> I mean, it's a normal portion and all that. If he has said I pick from Bono or Ahafo for that matter, then there's a problem. Look white. In other words, do the needful. Consult broadly and widely and make sure that the person you get represents uh, the true interest of Ghanaians. It doesn't touch on anything. Remember when we are even uh, the looking at for public office holders, right? We always edge them. We want the person to be this, we want the person... There's a standard. You know, public office is always man by the principle of what? Meritocracy, merit. So we want somebody who will have uh, that quality and he will be there based on what merit. It means that he has satisfied all the requirements, including the fact that he endears him or herself to many within the country. He has what it takes to be in that office. And he is not being considered for the position based on his what individual uh, connections or relationship, but he's based on strictly the professional uh, standard that he has met. And based on that, they want to select him for that office. I'm sure that is the essence in which the chief uh, was speaking. Okay. Now to the a key component relative to the 2024 elections. I'm talking about the limited voter registration exercise that's ongoing across the country. We are on day, let me be very exact, day three. Oh, no, day four. Um, and already there are concerns about the system online, which is becoming a challenge. Now the ECI has given direction that the, the limited registration should be done offline. Also, there are concerns raised about it not being decentralized enough to the polling station areas or the, or the electoral areas, but rather at the district offices. Are you seeing this process delivering every opportunity for oral to all eligible not to be disenfranchised? The free and fair election has a number of indices, and one of it is voter registration. That it is so crucial because it has the potential of undermining the electoral process if care is not taken and is not handled well. And that is why, uh, as election management body, in this instance, I'm talking about election, electoral commission, you listen to advice, you consult broadly, and based on your own experiences and the, 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 the situation on the ground, you take a decision that will be able to uh, deal with all the lingering challenges. Right. It is so important. If you are in doubt, you talk to IPAC. This is a body consists of political actors and other non-political actors and all that. So you have a wealth of what materials that you can what, rely on. Um, my little problem with the EC is that sometimes, yes, because the Constitution gives it the power that you are an independent body and you have the right to take necessary decision for the, the conduct of your work. They tend to uh, disregard advice from, you know, wise counsel from the public. That's, I find, very strange because nobody uh, is an epitome of knowledge, no. And that uh, two heads are better than what one, even though uh, I conceive that it depends on the type of head, I mean, that we are looking at. But... Uh, on a more substantive matter, we are saying that consult broadly and then take a decision that will uh, cure some of the problems that we have. What is the point of trying to register people where a number of them, if you don't take care, will not get opportunity to be registered? Then you defeat the whole process. Because we are talking about 
suffrage, universal adult suffrage. The meaning, the simple and straightforward meaning of this statement is that every individual who is qualified by law and attained the age of voting must be given opportunity to have him or her what name in the role of voters. That's it. Once he meets all the legal requirements, and if you look at it, any young person who has attained that age, there is what? Uh, the, the, the joy, there is the, the, the effort to get registered and then move on for life. So you want to make sure that that enabling environment, that equal enabling environment exists to make sure that you get everybody on board. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to believe that the EC is oblivious of this, but they are not. But that all that they have to do is that make sure uh, that they strengthen the frontiers of this process and make it work foolproof. That is all. Um, uh, uh, that, that I'm struggling to understand why sometimes they take such a very intense position and then last minute they come back to it. Make sure that you, you place uh, this registration at places where people can access easily and that uh, if you look at the, even the guarantor system where people have to go to uh, the place and then, as it were, um, support people according to the law, and that this person, I know him like about for him, and that um, he's qualified to vote and the rest of them. If people go to uh, the registration center and they are not able to do it, one or two instances, they shy away from it and all that. You need to factor all these things into calculation as an election management body. These are the things we said the, that body is an election management. They manage the processes, the procedures, and the institution what that drive electoral process to push it. And so uh, they have to get the basics right and get um, as many people who are ready to register to register. And um, there's always the ritual where people bash people. People want to undermine the system and all that. It is my hope and prayer that this time around, uh, the, 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 these things will be reduced to the barest minimum. Because I don't understand where a particular problem has been lingering on for years. And we don't seem to have what uh, a grip on how to what, deal with the problem. I don't understand. Let us remember that. There is always a way out to any problem, except that you need to be sober, you need to be full of ideas and innovative, and you are prepared to all, uh, deal with it head on. But uh, uh, it, it should be done. So uh, it takes me back to uh, sometimes I wonder whether uh, uh, this problem uh, will be over one day. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. In this age uh, and time where digitization has become the pivot around which some of these things evolve, you can deal with it head on. What does that tell you also about how much preparation has gone into this process? And I ask this because in the last district level elections, similar concerns like this came up. So does this, does this give you a sense that the, that, the, that the Electoral Commission is approaching this election with full preparation, or there are still major gaps to, to, to cover? Well, I will not sit at where I find myself now and say that they have not prepared. Uh, that would be disingenuous on my part and be unfair, uh, because the the EC mandate uh, is much seen <laughs> in the time of elections, <laughs> right? Where you're supposed to organize all elections, so uh, they are well aware of uh, all the processes and what it takes uh, to uh, get it to its uh, logical conclusion. The problem is that sometimes. Uh, their effort hit a snag, and that uh, they themselves uh, sometimes, by uh, their own pusher and attitude, they are not able to uh, deal with it head on. Otherwise, it's normal that when you have such a process, you roll it out. There is a tendency for a place to suffer some problems. But if it reoccurs, then it means that uh, you need to stay back and then reflect on it and find clever ways of going around it. And so, yes, <clears throat> they might have uh, prepared, but what is uh, playing out tells you that all is not uh, well. 
So they need to quickly inject in some fresh energies and to be able to uh, deal with it. It is associated with any human institution. You set a process in motion. In the course of that, you realize that there are problems here and there. That is where we are saying that all these things are managed by those who are intellectually and professionally fit to be able to handle it. They have those qualities. All that they need to do is to be able to respond to the occasion uh, promptly. Um, so, much as the, the, the EC needs to sort things out, what about the suggestion being given that they decentralize to polling areas or, or electoral areas so that no one is left in the loop, so that people don't have to trek long distances to come register, especially for these first-time voters? Uh, that point is what I find very... Uh, I'm worried about, in the sense that uh, this, for me, is a noble and a very fa effective uh, proposal. I think they should have considered it uh, well and then uh, work with it. Because what's the point of people traveling long distances to go and get their name in the effect? If the person is not interested uh, in the process, uh, anything can get him off the process. If we are talking about the, the the harsh economic realities we face today. If you want to overburden somebody in terms of what transport costs to go and do a simple exercise like this, if he realizes that if he is not deep enough to know that uh, this is a civic duty and it has implications on the very survival of myself and all that, if the person, the person is not able to what, put one and two together and make that meaningful deduction from it, he will just abort the process and stay somewhere. And all these things must be factored into when you are de designing or, uh, you know, allocating places uh, or earmarking places for such important exercise. You consider all those things. Uh, sometimes it's true that some of these things will slip through your fingers. You will not be able to uh, have it uh, on top of your head at the, the spell of the moment. But with time, even if you don't know and people suggest you reflect and say, ah, this is a good one, let me go for it. And, uh, because after all, it doesn't hurt anybody when a lot of people are able to access. Because the voter registration exercise uh, is anchored on the principle that you'll be able to get everybody who is legally qualified by law to get him or her, his or her name on the register. So uh, if there is any effort or there is anything that thwart this effort, you need to be able to arrest it immediately because then it defeats the whole principle of what that uh, an election body creating that enabling environment for everybody to register. Uh, I am not sure that the EC want to prevent people from, you know, registering. What is the point? Then they, they lost the whole business of being in the office. They are not oblivious of this fact, but the issue is that how do you go about it? Uh, that is what is lacking. But if they want to understand this and, you know, rise up to the occasion, they need to what? Uh, listen to what? Uh, why is cancel relative to these issues? And I'm sure um, there is always a way out. I want to quickly go back to you on the on the legacy conversation. Typically, in every dispensation, when a president serves his time and it's done, his legacy is assessed. What would you call the president's legacy? Um, if I want to assess the president, um, it depends on the epoch I'm looking at. Are we looking at the first tenure or second tenure or both? I want to know. Uh, both, because he ends his tenure at the end of this year. Yeah, when you say both, then uh, it's a tall order because you are talking about 2017 uh, to 2020 as a first uh, one. Then you come for 2021 up to what, uh, 2020. Uh, five, you know, seven, that kind of thing. Uh, the first tenure, uh, you realize that um, um, some of the things you can talk about that will be the legacy of the president was the fact that he introduced free SHS, uh, in spite of its problems that you and I know, um, it was able to do one basic thing, get people into classroom. And then it doesn't matter how difficult 
the government was able to uh, ferry the people across that various levels of academic, uh, you know, processes. They were able to get to their de destination. Um, you have seen them in tertiary schools. Uh, some have uh, gone, even finished the university and the rest of them. That's a big plus. At least, uh, in spite of the challenges, he was able to weather the storm and push this agenda forward. And we have seen uh, that you need that critical mass of people with the intellectual background to be able to drive every economic enterprise within the state. So this one thumbs up. We saw a fairly stable political atmosphere, which you need. Sometimes people ignore these things. But it is in democracy, there are two conditions, what we call necessary conditions and sufficient conditions. These are it's one of the necessary conditions that you need to maintain uh, a peaceful environment to be able to uh, champion your agenda, without which not you everything comes to naught. The first thing was that uh, you know stability was gained and all that. And you cannot talk about these things or governance without looking at indicators such as what the economy. The economy was solid the first tenure, in spite of a few challenges. They were able to maintain a reasonable uh, <clears throat> a quality of economy uh, that provided uh, some uh, measure of what means of livelihoods for people and the rest of them. Figures are there for me. Uh, time will not permit me to recount some of these things. Issue of what <clears throat> unemployment levels improve, uh, you know, inflation uh, that determines a lot of what uh, economic activities in this country was also <clears throat> maintained at uh, a certain reasonable level uh, and the rest of them. Uh, issue of health was taken seriously and dealt with uh, with dispatch. Uh, if you look at the issue of COVID, in spite of the excesses uh, associated with some of the monies that uh, the public continue to uh, force them to account relative to the way they procure uh, some medicines and then handle the health sector and all that above all. Uh, we're able to deal with the health challenges uh, of the capability to COVID and all that. If you look at the fact that uh, COVID brought down uh, the economic needs of the uh, country and then uh, the way we struggled to be able to uh, adjust to this. And in spite of all the challenges, the government was able to uh, pay public sector workers and the rest of them. That's the supply. But we are not oblivious of the fact that issues such as corruption, which is a critical index of what governance was still at its lowest ebb, in spite of uh, the rhetoric by the government and that uh, corruption uh, would not be countenance with the system. It turned out to be, uh, you know, an empty talk. The real talk shop never happened. And if you look at the highest performance of the president relative to corruption was 43%, uh, 43 and uh, if you look at uh, the, the worst of it, uh, was I think 41 or so, uh, or 40, uh, compared to John Mahama, whose worst was 43, and the highest about 48, thereabouts. It tells you that uh, the war against corruption uh, uh, had not been won. And uh, uh, from that time on, also, you realize that it is increasing with amazing rapidity. And um, from where I sit, I get the impression that even in the second tenure, there is no uh, 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 there is no opportunity to see the end of corruption or corruption reduced to the barest minimum. There is a, that nobody can convince me in that direction. Fast forward, um, you want to talk about this is a big subject, so I will not be able to talk about all the areas. But if you look at some of these indicators in the um, the, the the second tenure issue of what the economy comes critical and you realize that from the word go the government started having economic challenges uh we uh, based on uh, some of them yes there are external forces but the government also had a hand in that unnecessary and reckless borrowing has thrown us uh, to this level and then issue of uh, you know uh, very uh, poor economic uh, system that we have producing uh, one of the worst in terms of economic performance and all that inflationary figures 
uh, very, uh, they are nothing to write home about. Uh, they've gone high to hit the roof. Um, if you talk about unemployment, it has become so difficult for people to assess uh, jobs and all that. And because you see in the political economy, uh, as soon as the economy is hit, all right, um, it effects a rub off every sector. So you see unemployment, that's a problem. You see infrastructure development, all right. We are uh, seriously struggling with that simply because there's no means of doing that. Uh, you see issue of health uh, becomes a challenge. You will look at the a recent incident where you saw the renal section of the Kolebu uh, hospital, you saw the back and forth, <laughs> something. It tells you, gives you an idea that, look, all is not well. Um, we continue to see um, issue of corruption, not being able to, the government not able to deal with it. Um, and then if you look at all, uh, the energy sector uh, in terms of power, um, we are in crisis even though the government wants us to believe that there's nothing of the sort. But that one, uh, my humble advice to the Honorable Minister, that he should stop uh, talking about that there is no doomsday and all that. He's denting his own image. He's a man people respect. I, as a human being, I respect him. Uh, I like people like uh, who, who have worked and supported their people uh, through thick and thin. And that, but... The comment that he makes relative to this is purely insulting to us. I will want to advise him as um, a student uh, of politics that it will not do his image any good if he continue to say that there's nothing of this sort that is happening. Otherwise, I am experiencing, Ghanaians are experiencing doing so, and we are telling you this is it. You can stay somewhere and tell us that that is not the issue. Please, he should do his image good by shying away. If he doesn't have solution to deal with this problem at the moment, yes, he can be quiet. But so, by telling us that this will do his he is not doing so, that he is denting his own image. He has image. I must be honest with that. Yes, in spite of all the things he could say, I, from where I sit, yes, uh, he's a, uh, a credible man. He is so and so. But if you say these things, uh, people will begin to what, uh, punch holes into some of uh, the, 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 your characteristics and all that. That said, uh, if you look at the uh, issue of, uh, you know, senior high school, uh, it's still a plus for the government in spite of what <coughs> the numerous challenges, which I, I admit. But I still give commend a plus that in spite of all the difficulties, the government is what uh, bulldozing its way into uh, making sure this uh, policy uh, is maintained and all that. That is kudos to the president and then his policy. We have seen uh, here and there infrastructure development and all that, but we are not seeing much because from the word go, we have deficits in terms of what uh, debts that we accumulated and that which were needless, some of them, and then the way they manage the economy without listening to what um, wise counsel from people who have what it takes by telling. There were a lot of what early warning signals clearly written on the wall, but all fell on deaf ears. The government will not listen. Last minute, uh, things that the government decided that you will not do, they go back. I won't go to IMF. Right? And then the government is caught, is caught in a web of his own promises that they made that they are not able to do. Right now, if I look at my vice president, your vice president, Dr. Baumia, the difficulty he has that he has said so many things in terms of promises and what they're capable of doing now we can see, we can feel it, and all that. I am, from where I sit, I'm struggling to see how he's going to survive in this campaign where these things will be thrown at him, all right, and how he responds to them. So he has begun to respond to some of them and realize that they don't go to water. I am just a driver's mate and all that. These are things that you shouldn't have said at all because the president, the ticket of the president, all right, uh, the the, 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 the ticket, as the president and the vice, they have one ticket. Once you elect the president, you have indirectly elected the vice president. That is why, in absence of the president, the vice president, we don't vote for him again. He steps into the president and move on. All right? So if you say that, where are you coming from? But when there are good things, you quickly come and jump to it. That I've done this, I've done that. No. In politics, you don't pick and choose. You must be prepared to accept blame 
and what uh, also we will uh, support you by what uh, commending you for the good work done. But you need to be well good what accept blame and praises and move on. That is the spirit behind what any uh, governance enterprise. But that said, um, they are not, and they are having come to the end of what uh, the tenure. So we expect that all these things they will take them in their stride and build uh, from here, uh, so as uh, to have something to show during the election. Because mm. take it or leave it, they are going to be confronted. The vice president is going to be confronted with it. so many questions that he said for Emisata and the Mahama government. Those questions are going to what given to him. At that time, he was the examiner certain question. Now, he's going to be the student answering the same question that he posed for uh, his student, and we see whether he will be able to deal with it. That's mm. the challenge that he has. That he has. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you describe, uh, how, how would you rate the president's legacy? Oh, I will not go into that, because you see, it's not that simple. People will tell you, they will just give figures, that one. Uh, where I sit, <laughs> if I make that, I have rendered myself useless. You need to take sector by sector you take what sectorial analysis of each of them, and then before you come, and even that simple answer, we got five percent, and then for me, uh, it doesn't answer anything. As a scholar and a scholar in the area of political science, I need to look at what each of them is. That's why I issued that edit, telling you that um, I'm touching on a few things and talking about it. But generally, there are a lot to talk about, which I do not. Uh, the, the few things that I talk will make sense based on what I have said. And then out of that, uh, they, they, they can also take a cue and build from that. All right. Dr. Asa Santi, as always, thank you for your time and for joining us. Dr. Asa Santi is the Director of European Studies at the University of Ghana, who's also a Senior Political Science Lecturer, sharing his thoughts with us there. We will also get a quick perspective on the what the election observers have got to say relative to the limited voter registration exercise that has been going on which began this week. There are some who have had to go wait for long hours just to be able to register. Let's see what the uh, assessment has been so far from uh, the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers. This morning, we can speak now to Gilfred Isyama, the team lead for the Kodeo Secretariat in charge of elections, anti-corruption, and rule of law. Gilfred, good morning to you. Good morning and thanks for having me. Um, we have seen the limited voter registration done for the past three days. We are now on the fourth day. What's what's the um, what's what's Cordeo's initial assessment of how the process has been so far? Well, so um, over the past um, three days, we've seen um, continuous improvement. Um, on the first day, uh, there there was widespread challenge regarding um, networking issues that the BVR kit required to be able to function effectively. Um, the letter commission came up, um, admitted um, the challenges, and promised to resolve you know, the issues. On the second day, um, we still got reports of those challenges across the country. And again, the letter commission came up, um, admitted same, and they promised um, to take a different route instead of relying, um, going strictly by the, the online system. They say they are now going offline to enable more people to register. Could these challenges have been averted? Or these are systemic matters that can only be addressed when it happens? It's very difficult to say um, there are systemic matters that can um, only be addressed. Um, and again, you can't also rule out the possibility of these things happening. I mean, I think it's, valid, it's a valid question to ask um, the Electoral Commission what they had done um, to avert some of these things, what they had done to ensure that even when we face these issues, all the stakeholders would understand and appreciate it. Um, because one of the questions that we've been asking ourselves, we are wondering, was when did the EC um, did the test run? Is it too far from the time that we are doing re registration um, so that they couldn't 
estimate or they couldn't anticipate the kind of challenges that we are seeing now. Where were the test runs, you know, done? Was it in those areas or some of those areas that the registration was going to take place, especially the hard to reach areas, in order to be able to anticipate the challenge? Was it participatory? We don't know whether they got the stakeholders on board to understand the process of testing the kits, to also experience the kind of challenges that they face, so that in the midst of issues, all election stakeholders, including the political parties, would appreciate. But um, it appears the EC probably didn't do a good job um, on, 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 on these issues. I don't think there was much inclusiveness, um, much involvement of stakeholders in testing, in doing simulation for people to appreciate the kind of challenges that could happen once the commission decided to go to these hard to reach areas. Then everyone, you know, there wouldn't be any um, cause for concern because everyone would have known ahead of time that once we are going this way, these are the challenges. So, well, if you want to take them by their word, they say they had done um, test run, they were good to go, and then we got there, and then we are seeing these challenges. So they are primarily accountable for this. Um, but besides that, I must admit that they have been very responsive. Um, it, when you monitor how the commission has been communicating with the general public with respect to um, the acknowledging the challenges that have been happening um, and the decisions that they want to take to um, avert the possibility of disenfranchising um, newly um, 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 applicants or people who want to register to vote. I think it's, it's something that we must all um, acknowledge. There are some who have suggested that the limited voter registration should have been decentralized even to the area, to polling centers and to electoral areas. Could that have provided a better outcome than what we have seen in the last few days? Well, we had, we had um, maintained that that was the best thing to do. Um, we had insisted, but the commission decided that um, they were going to go it. Um, you know, they were going to go by the current plan. So I think we have gone past, you know, you know that, that issue. They decided they wouldn't go by registering in those localities as they used to be, maybe that due to resource constraints or some of the challenges that they were anticipating and uh, network issues which we are also experiencing now that they even decided to do it at their district centers and the hard to reach areas. Now the EC says they'll go offline relative to the voter registration, the limited voter registration. Is that a good decision? Is that a good path to go? How much of risk? What are the pros and cons of going offline? Well, I think um, going offline um, in the current you know, um, regime, what we are experiencing, I think is, 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 is a very good decision. Um, the fundamental point is that every Ghanaian who is 18 years and of sound mind is qualified to be registered and vote. This is their democratic right. And um, the introduction of the biometrics were supposed to help facilitate the process and also prevent abuse um, by people. So if the biometric system, which was supposed to facilitate um, the process, is going to cause major challenges, um, even to the extent of either disenfranchising people or upsetting the whole electoral calendar, because it probably will take us months if you want to strictly go by the biometrics to be able to go through this, and we don't have time for that. So um, the EC, listening to the cries of Ghanaians, um, in the face of people, the possibility of people not getting the chance to register and deciding to go offline, I think is very responsive and we must acknowledge that point. Um, we understand that this is not a new register. It is only an update that the EC is doing. So if we are not registering so many people, then it is possible that um, the Electoral Commission um, will be able to um, work on the data that they receive. The advantage of online is that um, it's, it's very fast. 
the computers are talking to, the machines are talking to each other, and they are also talking to the server. So once you put your details in there, um, at that moment, the, the machines would work together and ensure that um, your name is not already existing, your details are not already existing, and then you'll be free to go. And once you do that, you're automatically added to the system. But now, but now, um, what it means is that after um, the, the, the registration, the offline registration, they have to go back um, to the system, integrate or upload the data into the system, do the necessary matching to ensure um, that people who already exist have not taken advantage of the offline um, process to do double registration. And as I said, once we, we are not expecting huge numbers by the words of the Electoral Commission or by the estimates of the Electoral Commission, it shouldn't take so many um, days to be able to, to, to do this. There was a part of the upload of the data, if you had to go offline, which, which would be on a pen drive and sent. Is there not a risk in that? Well, I think even with the, um, with the, um, the, the online updates, they were still taking uh, backup you know, data from pen drives and the rest. So I think maybe what the commission needs to do is to provide more avenues to backup you know, this kind of data that they are taking. Um, so that somebody wouldn't go to the field and come back and say, I lost my data. And you wouldn't know when and how they will get those people back to, to be able to register. So these are precautions, and I'm sure the commission have been decided to speak to us. Um, um, they will do the due diligence and make sure that they have plan A, plan B, and even plan C to ensure the integrity of the data and to ensure that um, some of these issues that we are talking about now uh, wouldn't happen just to avert the risk. But we need to hear more about the Commission on how they want to avert some of these risks that we anticipate may happen when they resort to the offline process. All right. Thank you very much, Gilfred Isiama, for your time this morning and for joining us. We're grateful. Thanks for having me. He's a team lead for the Codeo Secretariat in charge of elections, anti-corruption and rule of law time check. It's a minute to now you're listening to Morningstar. I'll go for a short break now. When I return, there's something wonderful happening in our educational space that I need to bring to your attention. And every time I see libraries that are being built, a space for children to go open up a book and read, it gets me giddy. It gets me excited. So, after the break, we get talking. Stay with us. <laughs> 